And it wouldn't be until, until that civilization understood the balance between the male and female, understood the equali equality between the male and female, that they would be able to decode the code. And then that would mean that they were ready to do it. You guys follow what I just said? So basically, here you have to add the female god or goddess to the tetrahedron or to the isotropic vector metric. And if you did, you have the double of these numbers. And the result would be 72 plus 72 given 144, which is thought to be the, n the number of ascension in, the, um, in Revelation. As well in Revelation it says that the New Jerusalem is a crystal city with rainbows all around it. And that, that crystal city has faces of 144. There is exactly 144 faces on the outside of a 64 tetrahedron metric. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I thought I was on to it. And so I kept on reading the Bible, and I I got really interested now, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, this is all about the technology. This is all about Atlantis. And I um, I kept on reading, and I found something that was extremely significant. And this has been completely omitted by scholars. This is long after, you know, Moses was following the ark through the, through, the, through the desert. It took him 40 years to do a route that usually took only a year, okay? I know this because my father, actually my grandfather, uh, I, my father is Iranian, and my grandfather was a guide that brought people to Mecca from Iran. And it took him six months there and six months back in the desert. And so these routes were well known. And uh, actually, my grandfather lived to the age of 128. And uh, I believe that it's because he went to Mecca, to the Kaaba, which held the black crystal, the dark stone, or the black sun, as described by the Sumerian plates, given to man by the sun god. But in any case, Moses is taking 40 years to, take a, to do a route that should have taken a year. Why? Because he's following the ark. It's very clear in the Judaic tradition and in the rabbinic tradition that the ark is moving on its, own, on its own. Whenever the ark lifts and starts going, they would lift camp and follow it. And whenever the ark would stop, they would stop and put a camp up. Sometimes they would stay there for three, four years before the ark would start going again. So this ark will seem to have anti-gravitic capability. It seemed to be able to hover. There's instances where they describe the ark lifting the high priest that carried it. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about all this, and then eventually, you know, Moses dies, and, um, and Joshua is, has taken the lead. And Joshua arrives at the Jordan. And this is where I found this really interesting thing. Joshua arrives at the Jordan, and the Jordan is running at flood level. There's no way they can cross with the tribes of Israel. They're trying to get to Jericho on the other side. So Joshua doesn't know what to do, and he asks God. And God says,
Um, uh, uh, now, now, this is describing the high priest taking the ark and going into the water of the Jordan with the ark. And as soon as they put their feet in the Jordan with the ark, the waters are cut up. Okay? And then it says, you know, and then there's a whole bunch of other things. This is Jordan, uh, Joshua 4.22, for people that want to refer it. And the priests came up out of the river, carrying the ark of the covenant of the Lord. No sooner they had set their feet on dry ground, then the water of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at stage as before. So they went into the Jordan, sat there with the ark, while all of the tribes of Israel went across, and the water was stopped. And then as soon as they got out, the water started to flow again. Well, I thought that's interesting because one evidence of gravitational effect would be to stop the course of water. But what blew my mind is what come next, at the end of that chapter. For the Lord your God, they're talking about the ark, dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what had been done to the Red Sea when he dried up before us when he dried it up in before us until we had crossed over. Wow. That has been omitted. Because this says that they used the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to open the Red Sea with Moses. But in the section where they talk about opening the Red Sea, they just say Moses lift up his staff and open his arm and the Red Sea open. They forgot to mention that the ark was involved with this staff. And so here they do though. Here they make it very obvious that they actually, the power of the ark was, open, was used to open the Red Sea. That means the ark was not the box that was built at the foot of Mount Sinai after opening the Red Sea. The power of the ark had to be there with Moses before he crossed the Red Sea. And thus it was something else. The box was only something to carry it across the desert for 40 years. Probably he didn't have time to take the box out when he left Egypt. He just took the crystal. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you think Ethiopia has the Ark of the Covenant now? I'm going to get to that. So, um, are you guys all following this? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I was like, I was really excited. I was like, oh my God, this, this is really real. I mean, they, they're really talking about some object. And, um, this is kind of tough to do, this, but uh, we can, you know, I start to look into it and I found more and more evidence that the sun, that the, that the, that the earth was, um, was this crystalline structure. I found the Ezekiel text, I found the, the, um, the Keys of Enoch text, and I thought, and I thought, wait a minute, you know, what are they talking about? Well. I looked deeper into the Kabbalistic tradition and when I did I found that they didn't just give you like hints to what the geometry was, they actually said this is the Kabbalistic tree, this is the foundation of all creation and if you decode this you'll understand all of the universe. So I knew there that they were giving us a really good key to what was powering the Ark of the Covenant, since the Ark was thought to be the seat of God, the seat of the universe. And the Kabbalistic tree, K 
can commonly be described as the tree of knowledge as well. The tree that was placed in the Garden of Eden at the center of our Genesis. So when I looked at it, I thought, what is this? And you know, I started to read Kabbalistic tradition texts and all this. Oh my God, I got so confused. It was so confusing. There's so much stuff out there. And it's all philosophy. And I was really kind of not being able to find anything that was driving. But I was looking at the geometry. And what I did is I plastered it on the ceiling of my van so I could lay in my bed and look at it in the morning, every morning. And I was trying to decode it. And really quickly, I realized that the bottom part was a tetrahedron. And that the top part was an octahedron. But I didn't know what this middle part was. This, this X with a, with a box around it. I, I didn't know how to deal with that. And then I realized, wait a minute. This box here, this rectangle, fits in this upper rectangle. So I thought, oh, maybe they just took it and squashed it. So I took the top part and slid the bottom into it. And boom, the result was a tetrahedron and an octahedron on top, which is all of the vertices you need to generate the star tetrahedron with the octahedron in the middle. You guys see this? The only, this, to generate this, all you need is a tetrahedron and an octahedron and all the vertices and you can start building it. So I was like, oh, this is cool. As soon as you slide the bottom into the top, basically, as soon as you compress it, as soon as you collapse it, right, you obtain a 3D geometry. And then I realized that the Kabbalistic text said that there wasn't just one tree, but that there's four, and that they're attached at the crown, or at the root. Well, I assume that they were giving us only half the code again, so that there would be eight trees attached at the root. Well, if there is eight trees attached at the root, at the root, and each one are decoded to give a star tetrahedron as we just did, then the result is 64 tetrahedron grid. How do you know you've decoded it right? Well, when you're finished, you can actually plot the two-dimensional tree right on top of it, and you have all the lines you need with its sephiroth. The sephirots are these balls on the corner of the tree. The, the, the word sephirot comes from the word sapphire, referring to crystals. And when you plot the sephirot all around the tree, all around the 64 tetrahedron, since each tree has one sephirot involved in the middle, each tree only has nine sephirots. Nine multiplied by eight? Seventy-two. I had come back exactly to the tetragrammaton. And you've got and two other ways that you can do this. Mm -hmm. the top three are always considered to be separate and above man. It doesn't mean not separate. Mm -hmm. center, the center and the crown is in its own space. And the one space that's missing that you have filled in with your dark circle is da'at, known as knowledge. Knowledge, that's right. That point that's the esoteric sephirot in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I have, I have shown this to, um, to Rubin, Rubinic tradition experts.